What's going on, Geminites? It's your boy, Gemin, back at you with another recent reads. Just got done reading He-Man and the Masters of the Universe Omnibus. I will do a non-spoiler review. Stay tuned. Alright, guys. First of all, this is a huge book, man. I think it's uh, 1,450 pages of comics, and then it has a couple of variant covers, and it has some sketch work and other art in the back. But, man, this took me longer than I thought it was going to take me to read. I guess I was a little bit more confident than I should have been. But uh, we got through the whole thing. Let's talk about the book itself, and then we'll talk about the story uh, and the artwork, and we'll, and we'll look at it from a sky view as well. But I'm not going to give out any spoilers on this. There's a lot of cool things that happen in this book, but let's get going. So, first of all, you can see the dust jacket. Very cool. That thick spine. It's got this nice wraparound cover. So first things first. I pop it, freaks all the honey. This book covers a lot of material. So it covers He-Man and the Masters of the Universe Series 1, Issues 1 through 6. And it was kind of a prelude to the main story. It was pretty cool. It was like uh, Prince Adam, He-Man, uh, lost his memory. Everybody lost their memory and nobody knows who they are. And uh, you kind of... Uh, figure out who they are with them, right? Actually, I wanted to start this by saying I'm a, a pretty casual He-Man fan. As a kid, it's one of the first like toy series that I grew up with. I had a bunch of the toys. I um, watched the cartoon here and there, but there's a lot of stuff I didn't know. Like I've seen Hordak, but I never really knew who he was, so we'll talk about that later. And there's a lot of other things that I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. But I, I do want to say that you don't have to be a huge fan of He-Man to enjoy this book because the story and the art is fluid and it's uh, enjoyable. And if you're a diehard He-Man fan, <laughs> no question about it, you got to pick up this book. Anyway, so that's one through six. Then you get series two, which is issues one through 19. You get He-Man, the Eternity War, one through 15. Master of the, uh, Masters of the Universe, digital chapters one through eight. I believe that's where we, we get little one shots, kind of similar to how the Transformers IDW books were, where it kind of gives you history on each character. Yeah, because then after that you get Masters of the Universe, Origin of He-Man 1, Origin of Hordak 1, and Origin of Skeletor 1. Now, those I did have as single issues when these were coming out. I want to say it was like 2012 or 2014 or something like that. Yeah, 2013, 2014. Then you also get DC Universe uh, versus Masters of the Universe 1 through 6, which is the Justice League crossover. Uh, and then He-Man Thundercats 1 through 6, which is the Thundercats crossover. And then they throw in uh, the original He-Man comics. DC Comics Presents 47, which is the first appearance of He-Man in comics. Then you get Special Masters of the Universe Preview, which is like half of a comic. Then Masters of the Universe 1 through 3 from the 1982 series. And, and we'll talk about those things individually, right? So let's go to the uh, table of contents because I'm trying to remember what story was what, right? So the thing I don't like about this omnibus, and DC does it a lot, when you get to the next issue, it has like the Virgin cover. And if you flip that, it tells you the name of the issue. But it doesn't tell you like, it doesn't have like what issue this is. How do I know if I'm reading series one series two or eternity war i don't know <clears throat> yeah so series one one through six like i said is that whole they caught amnesia then you have the digital chapters yeah that's how i thought it went you get those uh you know the digital chapter that introduces you to battle cat uh randor evil lynn orco trap jaw then he-man skeletor hordak she-ra then we get into Series 2. Series 2 is really cool. Series 2 starts introducing the Hordak stuff. And Hordak, man, is like the big bad. He's like the Thanos of the uh, the Masters of the Universe. And then Skeletor is more like the Loki, right? And um, this, you get Despara, which is like the female version of Hordak. And her she has a lot of character development throughout this. So you get um, issues 1 through 6 of Series 2. And then it goes into the DC Universe crossover, which uh, follows directly from there. So, like, everything that just happened has just happened when you get to that crossover. And the crossover was okay. Um, it was pretty cool. So then it picks back up in Series 2, Issues 7 through... 
shoot through 19. And this is pretty cool. This, we get introduced into the villain Hiss, which is like this snake creature. And I, I kind of remember these snake people from, uh, from the, uh, toys back in the day. And you get some more char character development with Tila and, um... And there's a lot of, like, symmetry within the good and the evil, right? You have the sorceress, and then you have, like, the good version and the bad version, He-Man, Skeletor, and even the villains, they kind of mirror each other. So I don't really want to get too spoilery, but what I want to say is they really do a good job of digging deep into the He-Man and Masters of the Universe mythologies, man. They play it with a lot of those mythos, and uh, you get a lot of uh, payoff in, in these issues, man. I think um, they, they really flesh it out well. Now, after Eternity War, that is the end of the main story, right? So then you get He-Man and the Thundercats. And by the time I got to this, I was already He-Maned out. And the Thundercats crossover felt like, you know, I already the main story is already over. I don't care about this. And I was never really a big Thundercats guy. I never watched them as a kid or whatever. And um, it was just kind of a drag for me. Same with the um, original He-Man comics. I don't know if it's because I had read so much. But by the time I got to those comics, uh, the art is cool. It looks very, you know, Bronze Age. But um, the dialogue is very dated, man. And it was, it was kind of a chore to get through those last issues. Although I think it was very cool that they included them. Before we take a look at the art here, I do want to say that the binding on this book is not very good. You have some gutter loss, even at its widest points. And when you're reading it, like in the beginning, it's very difficult. You know, you kind of have to hold it. It flips backwards on itself. You know, it's a it's a very big book, so it's hard to read, like in bed or anything. I had to pretty much read it up here the whole time. When you get to the end, you have the same kind of problem where you kind of got to hold it open. So, I don't know. The binding's not really that good. And we've seen big bound books like Big Damn, uh, big Damn Sin City, Colossal Conan. So, I don't know why DC publishes these books with this kind of binding. They always go for these super thick books. And uh, the binding is terrible. All right, let's take a look at uh, the artwork, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the story, but we're going to keep it spoiler-free. <clears throat> All right, so let's check out the artwork. This also helps me remember a bunch of the stuff that I forgot. So here goes the cover. Table of contents. Jumping into issue one. Right away, the book does grab you, though. I really liked um, setting the tone of the universe. I thought the artwork was very clean, very you know good modern artwork. And the story was fun to follow. See Skeletor, Trapjaw. You get introduced to a lot of, you know, all the characters, the Sorceress, Tila. In the beginning, they don't know who they are. Even like Man at Arms and King Randor, which is uh, He-Man's father. Eva Lynn. Uh, Battle Cat. So you can already even see like with these pages and the gutter loss, you know? I mean, I uh, these are the digital copies. So this is like Randor's backstory. I always like Man at Arms' uh, costume design, like that face kind of mask that's not over his face. Trap Jaw, his story was cool. The Orko stuff, I never really knew who Orko was, man. I guess I just don't remember watching the cartoons, but it made this like a little bit of a cartoony issue. This looks like the Skeletor origin issue. Oh, no, that's the He-Man, probably. This is the Skeletor one. Very cool stuff. Not your He-Man cartoon kind of stuff. So then you get this female-looking Hordak, which is Despara. I'm not going to give any spoilers on her story, but it's awesome. Uh, still Despara. You don't even see Hordak come out until later on. Here's the Justice League stuff. I mean, it wasn't a chore. It was, it was fun to read. Did you get like a souped up Skeletor? He kind of goes super shredder, which is cool. 
Battle Cat's cool. You know, you get your Moss Man character. You get Merman. Constantine is on. Justice League Dark shows up. You get some different artists throughout the book, which is you know pretty pretty refreshing. It's not it's not uh, too jarring. Stratos. He goes hiss, very cool with the snake stuff, and the snake army and Hordak taking over Eternia, uh, Eternia and it's cool stuff, man. Triclops. So they bring in the rogues, man. There's more Despara. There's some She-Ra. See, here's like what I'm talking about, the symmetry. You got Panthor, Battle Cat, He-Man, Skeletor. Uh, Orko's the good guy's mage. Uh, Evelyn is the bad guy's. It's pretty cool. Here goes Hordak. Hordak is definitely the big bad up in this thing. You got some She-Ra stuff with, I forget what her horse's name is, Wind Rider or something. Cool artwork though, right? There's the Snake Princess. You got some Hordag vs. Skeletor, very cool. I think this is the end of Eternity War. I don't want to give spoilers, so we'll skip through. You do get your Mumra and your Thundercats and that crossover, and there's some cool, there's some cool am amalgamations they do throughout uh, th this mini series, and I want to say in the main story too. But in the Thundercats story, they do a lot of that, the, mi the mixing of characters. So then, like I said, you get DC Comics presents 47 with He-Man's first appearance and. Then you get this little half issue. Then you get the three-part miniseries from 1982. I guess that just followed those issues. That the art is cool. But um, the dialogue was just so dated, man. And then the last issue of the book here. Kind of just a little bonus. You know, it has nothing to do with the main story. Alright guys, so that's the recent reads on He-Man. I know a lot of you guys were waiting on this. I definitely would recommend to pick this book up. Like I said, either if you're a diehard fan, if you don't know anything about He-Man. It's a nice, refreshing take on uh, superheroes. You know, it's very um, Game of Thronesy almost. Like medieval times, uh, sorcery, magic, warriors, um, dimensions. You know, the Hordak stuff is awesome. The Ske Skeletor is dope. So I definitely recommend this. Uh, a lot of character development, not so much with He-Man, but um, with the supporting cast with Tila, with um, Despara. <clears throat> I think I think with the female leads mostly, they get the most development. Let me know what you thought about this run in the comments below. Make sure to drop me a like on the way out, and make sure to subscribe to the channel, man. We have uh, a slew of uh, good content and a. Big backlog of archive videos for y'all to check out. Stay minty. Peace.